Hello, and I'm at SingCon 2025 here in Singapore. And with me today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Donovan, who's going to talk to us about trap modeling. So thank you so much, Donovan, for your time today. You're welcome, Jean. Yes, yeah. So Donovan, earlier you held a workshop on trap modeling. And I think that for even for our cybersecurity our peer group and even for the general public, we hear a lot of uh, this terminology called traps, right? Yes. So there's trap hunting, there's trap modeling. Modeling. Yes. Um, so what? how different is uh, trap modeling from, you know, trap profiling, trap hunting and all this? Okay, maybe I'll begin with an analogy, right? So actually, even if you're not in the cybersecurity space, you do threat modeling all the time. And I'll give you a very simple example. So all of us live in, I presume, your own homes. And in your own homes, you certainly have uh, crown jewels that you want to protect, like for example, your safes. So of course, because of that, you will ask what can go wrong, right? For example, a burglar that enters your house and tries to see your safe. So that mindset in thinking about what can go wrong, how and then how you then set it right, is in effect what threat modeling is about. So you do this um, pretty much in your daily lives simply because you want to then be able to say with some level of confidence, okay, even if there's some things that can go wrong, I have certain mitigations that can set things right and I think I do a good enough job. So in effect, I have actually covered more or less uh, what the Threat Modeling Manifesto has to offer. So that's uh, Threat Modeling. You mentioned Threat Hunting. Uh, Threat Hunting is a bunch of folks in the blue team, right? being proactive in looking out for threats that might have already been actualized in an environment. So for example, there could be an attacker lurking in an environment and what they then do is to find the evidence of these threats through what we call indicators of compromise. So unfortunately, you don't really want to be a threat hunter in the house scenario because that means there's a burglar had already broken mm. into your house. Mm. That's a great analogy, actually. I want to dive deeper into that uh, sort of everyday analogy. But before we come to that, right, um, you have a very interesting quote that you opened uh, at your workshop, which gets into the why we are doing uh, threat uh, modeling. No side self, no like, enemy, win uh, yes, a thousand battles, correct. a thousand victories. Yes. So this is really, threat modeling is really about knowing your, uh, it's really about situational awareness, isn't it? Yeah, I would agree. And I think, uh, I mean, I, when I started my cybersecurity career, I started off from the offensive side, so I was a pen tester, right? And clearly, as a pen tester, we get paid for breaking systems ethically, right? And then after that, we will teach people how to fix these systems. So when you talk about saying knowing thyself and knowing the enemy is really putting yourself into that situation, uh, into that, in the shoes of the adversary and asking yourself from the adversary perspective, what would the adversary be likely to do? Uh, because... Thinking from the perspective of the adversary then helps you understand what you actually need to defend against and what you can go on saying, hmm, actually, while there is a real problem here, it is not so likely that the adversary will be able to exploit this. And hence, you may say deprioritize that compared to something that is likely to happen. Mm. Yeah, is it a bit like risk management, someone will ask? <laughs> yes. So at the end of the day, a threat model fits into a risk picture. Right. Basically, threat modeling, the activities that you conduct leads to some artifacts, right? a list of threats that exploit certain vulnerabilities as well as various mitigations. All these fit into a risk picture. Right. So typically, in a large enterprise, you have something called Enterprise Risk Management Framework, of which cyber risk is one of these components. Because at the end of the day, we threat model not so much because we want to show all the possible ways that an enterprise can be you know, compromised or can go wrong, but rather how then we want to set this right. And why risk is important is because an enterprise does not have unlimited funds. We, we all wish enterprises had unlimited funds, in which case we can quote infinite amounts for cyber services, but we can't, right? So we then have to teach enterprises, advise them on what they want to prioritize first. Mm. Yeah, this uh, risk management is not just applicable to enterprise, right? It's also applicable to individual, like yes. the example that you, you, yes. you provided earlier. But again, before we go to the individual, just want to get your quick take in terms of, you know, you say that we need to think like uh, the hackers, right? Yes. Put ourselves in the hackers' yes. shoes. And one of the best practices that components that you mentioned earlier is uh, creative thinking. Correct. So how difficult is it to teach creative thinking in threat modeling? <laughs> Okay, this is a big question. I think creative thinking here entails a few factors, right? One of the factors is that uh, when we start thinking about what can possibly go wrong, you know, we start by thinking of all the possible ways, simply because uh, in this process of enumerating all these threats, you may find that you enumerate a certain threat 
And then you realize, wait a minute, that is interesting. I want to dive deeper into that. And you just let that uh, brainstorming process flow naturally. And I think you see this process in quite a lot of um, other disciplines as well. For example, if you talk about the process of um, you know, team building, you to come up with, say, eventually converge into some agreement on like the team charter, etc. There's, of course, this brainstorming process, you know, I think they call it storming, forming, norming or something like this. I can't remember offhand. But the whole idea is that sometimes it is helpful to say no fewer bounds, just let your mind flow, right? And then from there, start to see what clicks and what doesn't quite click. So it's a team, this is a team exercise, team uh, brainstorming yes. is very important as part of the enterprise uh, threat modeling process, yes. isn't it? Okay. So what is the most surprising uh, threat that you've, you know, you, you, you have sort of identified in your, in your long career of threat modeling? You are onto a very important point, right? When we talk about surprising threats here, from my own perspective, I think from a cybersecurity standpoint, uh, we should pay quite a lot more attention to the social science aspects. At the end of the day, cybersecurity, we talk about it as people, process, technology. We talk a lot about the technology. Almost every buzzword that you hear today focuses on the technology, sometimes process, but we sometimes forget that people are actually at the heart of what we do. At the end of the day, do we build an application just for technology's, technology's sake? The answer is quite clear. That's not true. Uh, we build applications for users like you, like me, uh, and users like us can be fallible. That's why we f do fall prey to social engineering attacks. So we need to, in some sense, bring more attention to the people aspect when we talk about cybersecurity. Okay, so talking about the people aspects, mm. right, and uh, how we can fall prey, how mm. we definitely yes. fall prey to some of these uh, social engineering attacks, right? So tell us a bit about, I know that you've done a lot of work in this area. Tell us a bit about you know the latest sort of emotional triggers that the threat actors exploit. I, we hear about how they exploit our fear, right? Our greed, you know, our uh, uncertainty, right? Um, so tell us some of these uh, maybe novel techniques that the threat actors may be employing nowadays. Oh, I begin with a bit of history. I am sure you remember the good old days where phishing emails looked like they were full of typos. And they usually purport to be some Nigerian prince or some tax office, right? And then most of us will go, come on, that's a typo. Obviously, this is phishing, right? Have you remember, do you remember those times? Nigerian prince, right? But today, if you look at some of the phishing attacks, you see that, hey, they are quite well-crafted, etc. So I think, uh, sad to say, uh, some of these advances have been made possible because AI helps to uh, refine different ways of phishing somebody. Now, I'm not saying that the Nigerian prince uh, phishing attacks in the past were accidental. In fact, they were on purpose. I'll tell you why. Sometimes you add typos on purpose because you want to filter a crowd that is smart. So these guys, if they just throw their email away, you know, they just mark it as spam and they just toss that, they're likely not the target audience. The target audience are likely people who are less literate. They see prince, they see money, and they go, hmm. There is money, let's click on the link, right? So, knowing your profile, knowing your enemy in this case is also very helpful. Um, at the end of the day, the emotions that social engineers prey on are always all the same hope, fear, right? You always fear that the tax man will find you, you always hope that you win a million dollars. They are already human. Right, right. Okay. So talking about uh, you know uh, all these uh, human factors again. Uh, going back to your first example, analogy of you know applying threat modeling to ourselves. So uh, I was saying, okay, let's imagine me as an individual with a, my mobile phone. So yes. how do I go about doing a threat modeling of <laughs> <laughs> this? Okay, simple, right? Uh, do you use a swipe pattern on your mobile phone? Mm. You do. Okay. Uh, do you clean your mobile phone's phone screen very often? Uh, probably once a week. Once a week. Okay. So if you swipe your phone, right, over a period of time, what happens? Oh, right, you leave... Uh, you leave marks. So if you leave your phone, say, somewhere, or somebody uh, has your phone, that person may be able to see oh. your finger pattern and may be able to unlock your phone that way. That's a threat, right? Oh, right, excellent. Okay, th thanks for that take takeaway. <laughs> Never thought about that. Yeah, hmm. that's a really good tip. We used to joke talking about mobile phones. Sometimes, and especially, we, we, give, we like to crack this joke among married couples. 
the easiest way to crack into get into a phone is during sleep time. And I tell you why, very silly reason, right? Because, well, people use face recognition, right? So what happens when people use face recognition? You take the phone, you then direct it at the at sleeping your, person. No, yes, sleeping well, person. The, yes, the to eyes, unlock it. The eyes are not open. Or you use a face, a photo. Right. Okay. Okay. So there have been cases where these kind of techniques actually bypass what you call biometric authentication. But surely there were papers published on this, so oh. they had to improve the face detection algorithms oh, right. because people were doing this. Right. Okay. So that's obviously one example of insider threat that you never expect, right? I'll okay. give you a more conventional threat. Yes, a USB-C port on your phone, right? So you can actually connect a thumb drive to it. That's right. Yeah. So if you are able to find some way to auto run something, mm. you could do that. So on, on someone else's phone? Oh, yeah. Right. Or another threat, NFC. Mm. Nowadays, in Singapore, you know, in Singapore, it's uh, very convenient. We can tap our, you know, you can actually store a credit card on your phone and then using NFC to basically tap in and out of a bus. If that's your daily habit, what are the chances to switch off your NFC reader? Not very high. So somebody can also swipe that same phone and try to deduct, uh, try to you know make a transaction and deduct the balance off a debit card, or you know, basically steal money in short. And you hear this actually quite often in airports. Oh, I see. Okay, mm. interesting. Okay, so Donovan giving all these uh, three examples mm. of the uh, threats that face an individual mm. with a mobile phone. That's three examples that you have provided yes. so far, and I'm sure you have a lot more in the back of your minds, right? What do you do yourself when you, it comes to threat modeling yourself? You know, you have a mobile phone or two. Yes, I have a mobile phone and a I do not use I do not use a swipe pattern for one. So when someone saw my mobile phone, he was like quite disappointed because he was like, yeah, sure, I leave fingerprints on my I leave fingerprints on my mobile. Like the, nobody just cleans every time, right? But they could do nothing with it. Okay, so you don't use a swipe pattern. I don't use a swipe pattern. What do you use? Oh, that I can't tell you. You have to find out. <laughs> All right. I, I expose the, the secret. Okay. Uh, what else do you not do? I think it depends, okay. So I think first you have to understand your own threat profile. Are you famous or are you not so famous? Because if you're famous, then your threat profile differs. I'll give you an example, right? There are some people who are rep public representatives. And because they are public representatives, uh, you con consider them politically exposed. Once you're politically exposed, there are many things you suddenly realize you can't do. Like, for example, setting up bank accounts very hard. Everyone seems to want to track you. So then that is where you may have to start thinking of uh, extra measures such as making sure that all your communications are already secure. Right, so you may use custom software for this. Um, I cannot tell you exactly my posture because if I did that, I'll just I'll be encouraging your readers to find me and hack into my phone afterwards. That would be so. Uh, that's not good, right? <laughs> that would be a white hat hacker challenge. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So for ordinary public. Yes. Not famous. Okay. Not famous. Then I guess um, going back to things like the NFC example, right? Um, know that if you leave your NFC reader on, someone can swipe it, right? Know that if you use a swipe pattern, someone else can swipe. A good example, maybe you don't even think of any malicious person. Your child may want to unlock your phone because uh, the child may want to bypass parental control. Or the child has been seeing you yes. do a certain pattern. So your child will likely show the serve you. So you may think of it from the perspective of, okay, how do I make sure that I can, I can get into my, unlock my phone using a means that a child cannot just show the surf and uh, get in there, right? Okay. As you can tell, this exercise can go on forever. And the conclusion I would like to say is nothing is actually foolproof. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, one of the quotes that you also presented at your workshop is uh, prevention is better than cure. Yes. So nothing is foolproof. So sometimes, uh, sometimes, we prevent sometimes you everything. can't prevent everything, Correct. but you try Correct. your best to prevent most of the things you can prevent. Yeah. And having said that, uh, I would like to just add on something for um, the audience, right? Um, when something bad happens, I think it's important to ask ourselves what's the worst that can happen? So I give you a simple example. This, I think, is more applicable to the general audience, right? I think you have heard of stories of scammers that have basically made a victims lose like hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash because they managed to exfiltrate, say, a bank account. I think the simple adage of not putting all your eggs in one basket is actually true. Okay. And nowadays, uh, like it or not, because the mobile phone is so convenient, it's actually quite hard to follow their practice. So one thing that I personally do myself, which maybe some people might find it inconvenient, is quite literally not putting every egg in one basket. 
so have more than one mobile phone? Uh, some people do that. Uh, some people will say there will be some stores of money that they cannot access just by these means. Uh, in the more modern world of wallets, they call it a hot wallet and a cold wallet, right? So basically making sure to think through the question of what's the worst that can happen and based on that, designing your mitigations. Mm. I think that is a more helpful way of looking at this rather than to give a lock, stock, barrel solutions that may not work for everyone. Mm. I think, yes, so Donovan, I think we just skimmed the surface today yes, in terms correct. of threat modelling. Yes. And we hardly even touched threat modelling when it applies to the enterprise. Yes, correct. But we, we really delve into the individuals and even that, that yes. is just skimming the surface. Correct. So, I think we cannot avoid going to one of these workshops that is conducted by you. <laughs> please do, please come. Uh, I would say I'm very, very happy to um, give some insights on what I think are some of the enterprise grade threats also. And especially given how complex the threat landscape is today, I think a good a conclusion to this is that uh, what is really important in threat modeling is the mindset in understanding that things can go wrong and then understanding what's the worst that can happen and that will form the starting premise to then ask ourselves how we can set things right so that we can do justice not just to the regulators but also to the customers that place trust in the solutions that they use with us right do we do justice to the people that entrust us with the responsibility of making sure that the enterprise is reputable to be able to conduct business in a safe way Right, so on that impactful note, thank you so much Donovan for your time today. Welcome Jane, as always.